Hi everyone. Good evening. I'm Palka. Uh, I'm a assistant professor at Jindal Global Business School. I teach accounting and finance, and we cordially invite and we cordially welcome you all to the Inspiration Lecture Series, which is organized by the Center for Research in Emerging Economies of Jindal Global Business School, OP Jindal University. The center has hosted globally renowned academicians in its inspiration lecture series. In fall 2020, the center organized some 17 inspiration lectures on a diverse area of topics, ranging from social networks and productivity to universal basic income, from optimum urban reopening policy post COVID-19 to increasing ubiquity of artificial intelligence across multiple domains from comprehending pillars of responsible business to relating our present financial decision-making with our future self. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing Professor Shashanta Malik for our inspiration lecture series. Professor Malik is a professor of international finance at the School of Business and Management, Queen Mary University of London. He has been the co-editor in chief of economic modeling a leading 35-year-old scholarly journal published by Elsevier. He holds a PhD in economics from University of Warwick, UK. He has published nearly 100 peer-reviewed journal articles focusing on issues in the areas of international macroeconomics, banking and finance, innovation and development. He has researched different aspects of international finance and development at both micro as well as macro levels. He has also carried out a substantial amount of research on various aspects of macroeconomic modeling. In this talk today, Dr. Malik will discuss how inclusive financial development can be beneficial for banks. So I welcome Professor Malik. Thank you so very much for inviting, uh, accepting our invite, and we are all eager to hear you. I request all the participants to please keep your microphones muted and webcams turned off. And you can use our chat box throughout the lecture to ask questions, and we'll take the questions at the end of the talk. Thank you so very much, and the stage is all yours, Dr. Malik. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Palka. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, um, colleagues uh, at uh, Jindal Business School for inviting me today to give this uh, lecture. And uh, of course, uh, this is, we are passing through strange times and uh, I wish we had uh, the opportunity to meet in person, but uh, hopefully at some point in future, we'll be able to meet in person. As you know, classroom discussion is uh, more interesting than, uh, um, you know, delivering this lecture uh, through the web. So um, uh, I know it's a, uh, of course, I'm going to speak, but uh, yeah, I will take questions because it's convenient to have questions at the end. Um, <clears throat> um, so I just, uh, this is something which uh, I have been working on, uh, financial inclusion. And uh, I thought this would be of interest to audience here. Um, and uh, this is uh, important, financial inclusion is important because uh, uh, the goal of any uh, government uh, is to have inclusive growth, right? In order to have inclusive growth, you need inclusive finance, very important ingredient in the growth process. So um, the question I pose here is, uh, everybody knows that financial inclusion is good for development, right? There is a significant amount of evidence, uh, but uh, the question that I'm going to answer today is a, whether it is good for the institutions who provide these services, financial services. So if so, <clears throat> how is it? How is it beneficial for those financial providers? Okay, so that's the question. So basically, the pay, I have a, there are two papers which <clears throat> you'll find um, and those papers on my website here. 
uh, if you are interested in getting to know the details. But these are the two papers mm, which are published in Journal of Economic Behavior and Organization and uh, uh, in 2021, Journal of Banking and Finance. So I'm going to uh, draw my ideas from these two published papers. I think I'll focus more on the latest one, which just got published this month. And um, so I'll use some of the some results from that, not from the earlier paper, but obviously if there are questions, I could actually go into details later on. So what, <clears throat> what I'm going to do as part of this lecture is to take stock of the key issues on financial inclusion. We know it's an important public policy priority across many developing country governments everywhere in that particularly, this is a problem in the developing world, right? Inclusion is not a concept uh, Financial inclusion is not so much uh, important in the context of developed world because most people have access to banking services in developed world, which we don't have. Uh, I'll, I'll show you the statistics a, a little later. So the, the idea here is that in, in what way, okay, and how uh, this, uh, providing these financial services would benefit would enhance the performance of um, these financial institutions who provide these services, okay? So we would like to know if it is going to be beneficial, then clearly one could establish that uh, inclusion can be a channel, it can be a mechanism to, perform, to improve um, the performance of banks, okay? So that's my goal here in this lecture. And, uh, and uh, I'll use the evidence from this, mainly from the last, uh, this recent paper, 2021, okay? So what is this? What is financial inclusion to begin with? We know we basically would like every adult member of the society should have access to basic financial services. What do we mean by basic? Basically, they would have at least access to a bank and having a bank account. Okay, that's the minimum. Then there are other things that will come later on. But the first thing is to have a bank account. And we know why it is important. I will go into details later. So let's look at this data globally. What is the status? 70, around 70% 70 of adults around the world have access to basic financial services, meaning they have a bank account, right? So basically these areas here, uh, deep blue, these are the countries where most people, you would say over 90% of people have access to uh, a bank. But look at these gray areas, okay? And uh, these are the countries where people don't have like around, I would say around 50%, of those adults lack access to a bank. They don't have, they're excluded from the formal banking system, right? So, so clearly you can say that it is not a problem for the developed world. So when we talk about financial inclusion, we are keeping in mind countries in like in Africa, countries in parts of Asia, right? And Latin America as well not so much in Western Europe, not in North America, not in Australasia and so on, right? So we would like everybody to have access to these basic financial services. But if we look at the, in terms of percentages, you saw that around 70% uh, people have access, that means remaining 30% don't have, okay? But the story is different if we separate them into developed and developing countries. In developing countries, around 50% uh, people have access, remaining 50 don't, okay? So you can see the number 1.7, not just in terms of percentages, but in terms of a total number, 1.7 billion people. This is based on 2017 survey data by the World Bank. 1.7 billion people lack access to a bank. They are excluded, okay, financially from the formal banking system. So if you look at those numbers, where are those people located? These, they don't have access. You can see the big part of the big proportion of those unbanked 
adults. They are, you know, you can see China, India, 200 million here. This is 2017 data. If you had, if you look at this survey for India in 2014 or before, the number would be much bigger. Okay, I'll come to that little later. So this is around 200 million people still don't have access in India. I mean, obviously it would have changed. This is 2017. If you do that analysis today, it could be much, it could be a smaller number, right? And uh, so China, you can see, and then of course the scattered all over Africa, there are, uh, you know, people like 10 to 100 million people don't have uh, um, uh, access. Uh, I think uh, some of these uh, countries here, and uh, of course, in some countries in, in East Asia and so on, and of course, Latin America. So um, uh, given that what we have seen also at the same time, although people are excluded from the, uh, from the banking system, uh, like around 1.7 billion people, but one another on the other hand, so what is happening, banks are not allowing these people, they don't like these customers to be part of the banking system, right? Probably because it could be risky to serve small customers like uh, poor customers, right? And they don't want to have any business with them because they could be risky also if you have loan exposure. So therefore, on the other hand, there has been significant improvement in technology. Although people don't have like small traders selling goods on the street, they don't have access to a bank clearly they have access to technology in terms of mobile technology, right? You can see that uh, people use mobile phone. I, mean, I think most people use, I'll give that statistics here. The access to uh, you know, mobile phones and internet have significantly increased. And um, that could be creating opportunities to provide financial services to this segment of the population who are excluded from the formal banking system, right? So which could be tapped by whom? By people, by these network providers, by mobile providers, okay? If they're allowed to provide or um, undertake uh, uh, banking transactions. So which has been, a, um, you know, uh, which is being promoted a lot in African countries, also in India. So because this access to mobile phones and techno and internet, that has increased significantly. You can see these numbers here. And, uh, and that is enabling um, digital financial services, okay? So there is this concept of a digital financial inclusion, which is also being um, emphasized by policymakers in many countries, um, including China and India. Why it is happening? Because most people have access to mobile phone around, you know, the number is like over 93% um, in high income countries, but in developing countries, somewhat similar. It's no different. The way we saw the previous number, you know, 90% in advanced countries, they have bank access to banking services, but around 50% have access to banks in developing countries, right? Look at this number. So when you look at the access to uh, mobile technology, you can see over 90% in developed countries, it is the same. Even if you look at middle tier or low income countries around 70 to 90% similarly. So this could be tapped because they are being, these people are being excluded from the banking system. Therefore, um, other like intermediaries like net, uh, mobile operators, mobile network operators, they are stepping in to provide um, banking services. They are being allowed, okay, uh, to, to do so because there is a demand for it, right? People want to make transactions. They want to send money from one place to another, maybe within the country or between countries and so on. So therefore, let's look at that in what way that market is growing, what we call mobile money, okay, as opposed to mobile money account as opposed to deposit account. You can have a deposit account with a bank, uh, but uh, um, um, you usually, you know, mobile phone operators, they were not allowed, uh, but now they are being allowed to help, uh, uh, you know, tap this market. If they're not allowed by the regulator, of course, they will not be able to do it. 
clearly there is a demand for it. People want to send uh, uh, money from one place to another. And therefore, um, there is a, um, this service being provided, mobile money accounts being created. If you have a bank, if you have a mobile number, you, are, you can now go to your operator and open a mobile money account, right? So still you can use send money from one place to another or um, to your contact in L another place. You don't have to go through the bank, okay? So basically banks can see that is competition. They would be losing these customers if they don't embrace these people into their system, right? So and you all know, we all know that banks are always looking for new markets, new opportunities, you know, and that's the way they could expand their business. Okay, you can't just always work with the same number of customers that you have had before. There is always this goal towards uh, bringing in new customers, new people into your uh, business. So there is this change in business model at, at the same time. So you can see here, India, you know, there are other countries here that deep blue, meaning like 500 um, uh, adults for 1,000, okay? So you can see like 50% for every uh, 1,000 adults have access to this mobile or do have, they have mobile money accounts, right? So which means they don't go through, they could do this. Obviously they could still have a bank account. You can also have mobile money accounts. There could be duplication there. But the point I'm making is that this sector or this market is growing. It's, you can see, these are the blue areas, right? Deep blue, light blue, these areas where you could be having, you know, less than uh, uh, 500, less than 500 uh, adults or every 1,000. That's the data I took from uh, uh, IMF, Financial Access Survey. So you can, uh, so the point I'm making here is that uh, there is a need for, um, um, you know, undertaking, carrying out banking services. There is a need probably to um, say, send money and also to save money, okay? So as long as we think about uh, uh, sending money, clearly there is obviously there is going to be some gain. There could be fee income. These mobile operators could be earning that, right? Because banks are not taking these people in, so they would be losing that revenue, right? Now, to, so this is where uh, clearly it's a benefit for uh, these mobile operators. Now think about savings. When this money, this money, you, you save money uh, through your mobile money account with these operators, these op operators are not uh, um, keeping money with themselves. What they will be doing? They will be putting that money in their bank account, wherever they have a, an account, right? Mobile op operators, clearly they have bank account. So the money will ultimately make its way to the banking system, right? If, you, if people are saving, if these mobile money account holders, if they save money with these uh, um, uh, network providers, mobile network providers, then uh, that money will make its way to the banking system. So there is clearly benefit in that sense, they are not excluded completely. Banking system is not excluded, but clearly this is a loss of revenue for banks because they don't take these customers, right? So what is the alternative? What could we do? The alternative is you should make uh, banks to take all customers. Then clearly this segment will not grow. This, there is no need for mobile money accounts, right? So, and this is an interesting, now this is where I'm going to bring in the case of India, which has been a, um, you know, a revolutionary financial inclusion program introduced in 2014 by government of India. And uh, this has been described as revolutionary by the World Bank. And uh, so gov if governments undertake, they adopt pro-access policies, that means to bring everybody into, or every adult into the banking system. Therefore, um, anything that, any policy that is introduced that will have an impact on these people. And there would be also, uh, banks would exactly know in terms of uh, the amount of money that is being saved with banks and so on. So let's look at this program and how, 
uh, what has been its goal and so on. I'm not, my goal is not here to, uh, to evaluate the effectiveness of this program. That's not my goal. My goal here is to use this example to motivate what way it's going to be beneficial for banks. So this program, as you know, all of you know, this government of India launched this program, uh, Pradhan Mantri Jandhan Yojana on 28th August, 2014. And uh, within two weeks of, uh, of uh, the introduction of this scheme, banks were able to accumulate retail deposits of 15 billion Indian rupees, which is equivalent to 240 million US dollar in just in two weeks, and they brought in 30 million new accounts. Okay, now look at this, uh, um, you know, its impact over the last six years. La last six years, 420 million um, uh, unbanked adults have now become part of the banking system today. They have access to banking services they did not have before 2014, 420 million. So how much, so the goal here, the government or the banks, the goal here was not to bring in money from these people, that was not the goal. Even if you have, have no money, you will still get access to these accounts. Therefore, the government can establish a link with these people which were being excluded before. And therefore, you know, you could have a direct benefit transfer. So it helps government money getting transferred to these people. It uh, obviously it will have, it will stop any kind of leakage from the system. And uh, so although the goal was not to bring in any money from these people, right? Even with zero balance, they were allowed to open an account. But if you look at the amount of money that were that uh, that was mobilized uh, by uh, these, um, you know, banks who provided these accounts, were to the tune of 1.4 trillion Indian rupees, right? Which is see, over 19 billion in uh, US dollars. Think about this money. So this, so much of money was staying outside the banking system. So clearly it was not being tapped by banks. They were not being used by banks. So clearly the banks would not be able to benefit from this money, right? So when you get this money, these are being available at a lower cost. You know deposit rate, you know lending rate, if banks could make use of this money for productive investment, you know that is an interest rate spread. So clearly it is going to be beneficial. Directly it will give rise to an increase in return on assets for, the, for these, uh, these banks, right? So therefore, uh, the, the point I'm making here is that uh, um, um, if, uh, if you allow these customers, if you embrace financial inclusion, what is the initial impact on banks? Immediately you will see increase in deposits because the money that was staying outside the banking system would be now part of the banking system therefore. And this could be because these, these uh, funds are available at a lower cost, they are more stable, they're not going to um, leave the banks, right? I have been monitoring this number and this number has been growing all the time. Really, if you look at last six years, this amount of money in these accounts, it has been growing steadily. And, um, and so you, you, you kind of, you can think about that uh, probably uh, people, those who are saving, they don't really bring in money today and then take out money tomorrow, right? But when you think about what is the other side, other way that banks could uh, get access to or uh, have a, a funding, there are two ways, right? One is retail deposits, deposit funding. Some banks rely on deposit funding. Some banks rely on wholesale funding, meaning they're borrowing from the interbank money market, right? So, so when you when you have this wholesale funding, that money could come in. That could money could go out. It's going to likely to be more volatile. Whereas when you have this, if there are some banks that rely on deposit funding some banks that rely on other sources of funding. Therefore, so the banks, those who rely on deposit funding in order to undertake their business, so clearly they would be, they would be benefiting from this additional, from this uh, uh, mobilization of these deposits, right? Because these are low cost funds and uh, 
clearly if you are investing in high risk investments or you know investments which could give you higher return that is going to be beneficial for a bank so my my point is that this is just an example to illustrate that uh, uh, the initial impact is going to be through the deposit channel on banks okay let's not bring in the loan side of the story that uh, i will discuss later but the immediate impact on banks is going to be through the deposit channel so let me um, so that that's how i'm going to motivate this idea right let us look at what we are doing in this paper my goal here is not to evaluate um, the program um, the uh, the um, financial inclusion program by government of india that's not the goal it could be done in a separate paper uh, but i'm just using that to motivate how it could be beneficial for banks what is the channel how it could happen so uh, it has been well documented in the literature that you will find many papers which are written on this issue that greater access to finance okay uh, increases savings it lowers income inequality lowers poverty and it, because it increases employment it improves overall well being okay so this has been well documented in several papers i'm not going to list those papers here but there is very little in terms of understanding what way any this kind of uh, um programs um targeted towards uh, um you know people at the lower end of the income distribution what way these services are going to benefit banks in what way this type of inclusiveness can impact soundness of banks in terms of bank performance so if it can help clearly this is going to be also important to have inclusive financial development and growth okay so first i'm going to define how do we do this there are three different ways i'm going to do this in this paper first uh, we will be doing through the supply side what banks provide then we'll be looking at uh, uh, what people demand from the demand side you know um, using a different data set and then i'll look at uh, towards the end of this talk i'll look at a specific policy intervention and to countries which have uh, embraced that uh, pro access policy and countries who didn't do anything about that so these are three different things i'm going to talk uh, as part of this lecture so first i begin with uh, this idea of uh, um there are two dimensions here outreach and usage okay so when we talk about outreach of banking services we refer to it could happen both demographically and geographically Uh, okay so it can be when banks provide these services okay let's keep in mind these are traditional mode of uh, providing banking services right bank branches atms these are the traditional ways that uh, banks uh, reach out to their customers and um, but of course things have changed now there is so much of mobile banking now this is a new thing you don't have to really go to, go to a branch so the demand for that you know services at the bank is not so much there people do most things through mobile banking so these are two different concepts mobile banking is something which is provided by the banks okay when we talk about mobile money accounts those are the things which are not provided by banks they are by, provided by non banks but they are not financial institution they are mobile operators let's keep that uh, distinction clear so you have we have this demographic meaning number of bank branches and atms for 100000 people for every 100000 people therefore it's comparable across countries okay if we don't do that we will not be able to compare across countries there and the second geographic outreach and here we look at uh, Uh, per 1000 square kilometer within that area how many bank branches and how many atms are provided by the banking system in each country so remember this data is going to be at country level for every country will have like uh, um, around 100 countries here in a, in this uh, research um for the usage dimension 
we are using the number of this is like uh, exploring the the depth financial depth so this you could categorize this as financial breadth right how widespread the service network is um, you know uh, geographically and demographically and here is like a number of a bank accounts for uh, 1000 people right so this basically captures the depth of financial access so clearly one you would th think these these things are correlated right the because uh, um, you know this is like a, um, the banking's uh, geographic and demographic outreach and here also the same uh, bank account so so clearly there is a high correlation if you check so what we do is we have to extract the common variation across these indicators. So what we do first, we try to check only the outreach index we construct by taking these four different indicators. These are four different indi indicators, highly correlated, and therefore we extract a common variation uh, and we call that index as outreach index. This is basically one data point, sorry, one uh, indicator. So clearly there is nothing to do. So now we can combine outreach, outreach with usage. Okay, those two we combine, we create another index. So these are sub, um, outreach is a sub index. And then we combine the two, we create the overall index of financial inclusion. Okay, so let's look at the data. We do that across countries. Um, uh, we have a, here, you can see there is significant heterogeneity across countries. There are countries at the top end of the inclusion distribution, like South Korea, Belgium, and Japan, clearly, you know, relatively developed. Uh, and here you can see the very low, high, low income countries like Afghanistan, Yemen, Malawi, and these countries and the low end basically, you can say financially less inclusive. Okay, countries at the top end are more inclusive. And if you even if you separate them, of course, we have here 86 countries, they include um, some developed countries as well. So even if you separate them, like, you know, very high income and then low income, there is still among low income countries, there is significant heterogeneity as well. They're not the same, okay? So, um, well, so um, as we see here, there is a uh, significant heterogeneity in um, financial inclusion across countries, even among developing countries, right? So since the, since the financial um, crisis, you know, global financial crisis of 2008, and uh, many uh, international organizations, multilateral agencies, they have come forward to promote this idea of financial inclusion you know, inter IMF, G20, the AFI, and this is Alliance for Financial Inclusion. This is an important network of governments, developing country governments, okay? I'm going to actually use this information to, uh, to look at the role of proactive, uh, proactive, uh, you know, um, access uh, policy. And, uh, and try to look at some governments do something about it, some governments don't do anything about it, right? So we can separate them. So I'll use this information later on. So keep that in mind, AFI. And um, so there is also World Bank, which is CGAP. So they, they also, so all these institutions can forward to promote uh, um, financial inclusion because it's very important important to have inclusive growth. And um, since then, they have uh, done many, many uh, policy initi initiatives, including, you know, pro-access laws, regulations to somehow uh, make banks uh, be interested in providing these services. Obviously, they are more interested, you know, let's think from banks' point of view, they are profit-making institutions, they are not charitable institutions, right? So their goal is to make money, So, and they, if anything that brings in the income for the institution, they would obviously be interested because they are indeed continuously searching for new markets, opportunities, and new segments, right? And uh, when there is this competition between, um, uh, between the, uh, 
um, um, this mobile operators and banks. When you have these this type of competition, obviously banks would be more interested now. So the countries where they are proactive, they are actively pursuing pro-access policies in those countries, um, banks would be more inclined because they know the benefit of that is that you can have uh, um, um, you know, mobilization of uh, deposits, which uh, they could tap, and that would that was remaining untapped before, right? So, so the, what is the key goal of this financial inclusion from a bank's point of view? They could mobilize retail deposits, which were, um, you know, staying outside the banking system, and these deposits tend to be more stable. In other words, if you look at um, the volatility of those funds, this volatility would be very low. So there is a low volatility of these funds because the funds tend to be more stable. They don't come in today and leave out, move to leave the bank tomorrow. They tend to be more stable with the bank and therefore banks could make use of those funds for some investment that could give them a higher rate of return, right? So, um, so therefore, so this is a, uh, if you are, if banks are operating in a more inclusive system, they would be benefiting um, in the form of uh, mobilization of greater deposits, cost of those deposits say, um, is uh, low, and therefore they could get this low cost or cheaper source of long-term funding, and which could be used in risky investment, which would give them a higher rate of return, right? So there is also evidence on that. So the benefit is in the form of um, collection of higher deposits, it would benefit only those banks who rely on deposit funding, not everybody, because there are many banks, they don't rely on deposit funding. Let's think about, you know, think about private banks, they don't care about deposit funding. And there are uh, foreign banks, they don't bother about collecting money within the country, right? They have they've invested in other types of investments, so um, so therefore the only those banks who rely on deposit funding as their source of uh, funding, main source of funding, and uh, they would be able to benefit from this low cost, uh, cheaper source of long term funding. Okay, and hence it is a plus. So therefore, funding cost goes down, rate of return we would expect it to go up. Right now, let's think about this. This is funding cost is the benefit. There is also when you operate across um, different regions within a country, and there is also cost, operating cost could go up. Operating if your uh, you know, branches are away from the headquarters, there is monitoring cost. There could be, you know, if it's a complex organizational and product structure, there is also cost depending on the customer base and so on. So where you operate, if you don't have customers in that area, it's also, there is going to be uh, the cost, operating cost could be higher in that, those, those branches relative to the branches which are located in cities, right? So therefore, there is this element of uh, operational cost. So if this operational cost, if they dominate, you know, funding cost, clearly banks will not benefit. They would only benefit if this funding, um, uh, you know, because this decline in funding cost is significantly, if it's going to, um, um, you know, going to outweigh that uh, the, any kind of, any possibility of rise in the um, operating cost, it would obviously be beneficial, okay? So if benefits exceed cost, it would be beneficial. Otherwise, it's going to be um, a loss-making um, approach for a bank. So what we are doing here, I've already, um, already discussed uh, uh, the motivation. So our goal is here to show that financial inclusion is positively associated with bank performance and um, and so, and the second hypothesis that we look at is that uh, you know different countries have different types of banking reg restrictions, restrictions on banking activities. There are restrictions on uh, capital requirement. And there is high capital uh, stringency. They need to keep uh, set aside, you know, 
um, this capital buffer, capital conservation buffer, capital, uh, uh, you know, counter cyclical capital buffer, you know, all these requirements are there because it's in bad times, it is going to be beneficial for banks, right? If you have additional capital. So, um, uh, so in the presence of those restrictions still, whether banks would still be interested in doing financial inclusion or not, right? So that's the story, that, that's the idea. So we consider here two key regulation, only two, and not looking at many things. First one is uh, uh, the, the, uh, the restrictions on banking activities. The second one is um, capital requirement. Uh, so if there is high capital requirement, what way it's going to be, would banks be still interested in doing financial inclusion, okay? So we, if I have a time, I'll discuss that, but uh, mainly uh, I'll try to present the broad set of results. Uh, so um, what we do in this, uh, you know, basically you can consider both papers um, that there is clearly a positive uh, uh, association between inclusion and uh, bank performance, whether you consider bank stability, whether you consider bank efficiency, either way, it is beneficial for banks. And the key, the, 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 the channel through which it's going to be beneficial is via the deposit channel. Let's remember that, okay? Deposit channel, I'm not going into the risk dimension here. If there are questions, I'll pick up later. So, um, so by doing so, uh, what we are able to do is we are able to combine these two strands of literature. On the one hand, we know inclusion is good for development, right? It has been well established. On the other hand, there was little information on whether this financial inclusion could be a channel for better bank performance, right? We show that, yes, it does help improve uh, uh, banking um, stability, banking, bank efficiency, and so on. So therefore, we are able to bring these two things together, two literature, development literature and banking literature together in order to show that, yes, um, financial inclusion, which is a development concept, okay, is indeed good for banks. That's the main idea that I'm going to show you. A lot of the results I have here. Um, so we use data from the standard sources, uh, which is called nowadays, it's called Bank Focus. It used to be known as Bank Scope Database. And uh, we, we have our unit of analysis is at bank level. And uh, we have, of course, a country level uh, characteristics we need to take into account because, you know, different countries, they have a um, uh, they are different, different countries are different. So there is country level heterogeneity, there is bank level heterogeneity. So we need to consider all that before we conclude whether inclusion is positively associated with, uh, with uh, bank performance. So we also consider the regulatory structure in the, in the countries that are included in our sample. So it is important, some countries are more uh, restrictive, some countries are less, uh, and what way? Of course, so when, they, when you are already operating in a restrictive environment, you'll not be interested in taking additional risk by bringing in customers who could be, who are known to be risky, right? If you have loan exposure. As long as you don't have loan exposure, clearly, absolutely, there is no risk because you collect their money and that's how you benefit, right? So our main source of this financial uh, inclusion data is IMF's Financial Access Survey. This is the data set, it's publicly available. Anybody can download this data and you can undertake analysis. What we do, because there are these uh, uh, four uh, different indicate, not different, I shouldn't say, four closely related indicators of outreach and then another indicator usage and hence, we need to first construct a sub-index, okay, of outreach. We do that here. It's a kind of standard principal components analysis where uh, you have these four different indicators. I goes from one to four, 
and these weights are being determined, then combined, and we construct this outreach index. And subsequently, we then combine outreach with the usage. We call that as an inclusion index, financial inclusion index, right? And that's the data you have seen. Now, what I'm going to do is show you as inclusion, as financial inclusion increases, countries with greater level of financial inclusion, you can see tend to have banks with higher level of stability, okay? So here we are using the standard uh, accounting score. This is the accounting, um, you know, accounting um, indicator, Z score, which is somewhat backward looking. And, uh, but it kind of, it gives you an idea that uh, banks, those who are operating in countries with greater level of financial inclusion tend to be relatively more stable, okay? So clearly there is a significant heterogeneity. It's not that everyone, every bank is on this, you know, um, similar uh, experience. There is also, uh, you know, higher level of inclusion and higher level of, but on average, on average, you could tell that story that there is a positive correlation, but you cannot really conclude anything from this, any causal inference. So what we have to do for that is we have to control for, because the countries are different. All these countries are different. We need to control for, um, you know, their uh, uh, unobserved heterogeneity, right? And uh, anything that is observed, clearly you can control for observed heterogeneity. That will have controls. But unobserved, you need to take into account introducing some dummies to capture that um, and then uh, uh, estimate uh, those regressions, which you, I'll do that now. And um, the, uh, you know whether we use stability score or use effic efficiency score. Efficiency when we do, um, this, is, this can be done in many different ways, okay? We have just done with uh, using a standard approach um, uh, DA approach to calculate efficiency. When we talk about efficiency, what does it mean? It means like, you know, every country, you have a different efficiency frontier, right? There are banks, uh, um, there are better performing banks, there are poorly performing banks. Banks, those who are uh, um, close to the frontier banks, okay? And so clearly they will have a high efficiency score. Right, it can it you know it's bounded between zero and one, so that's the efficiency score. So you have high efficiency, low efficiency, and uh, but what we find here is that uh, countries with a greater level of financial inclusion tend to have banks with higher level of efficiency on average. On average, there is a positive correlation, right? But clearly, as I said, there is significant uh, uh, heterogeneity. Um, across these countries. So this is country level information, financial inclusion. This is bank level. Of course, we take a um, average, take an average uh, for each country in order to do this scatter plot. So um, uh, very quickly, we are uh, uh, trying to, in this uh, set, in this set of results, uh, I'm trying to estimate the impact of inclusion on efficiency while controlling for observed heterogeneity observed heterogeneity across banks, okay? Observed, heter um, uh, uh, yeah, these are the bank controls. And um, these are, uh, we have some country controls. They're again, observed uh, country controls, right? Things that for which you have data, but things for which you don't have data, there is also that heterogeneity, right? You would have to take uh, introduce dummies for unobserved heterogeneity across countries. We also have year dummies and, uh, and so on. And then, uh, so clearly, I is across banks, J is across countries, T is over time. Our time dimension here is 2004 to 2015. That's the data set we have used until 2015. Now let's look at what we find. We find that uh, on average, there is a positive correlation between, um, I think, it is, were we able to see this header on the top or, uh, uh, sorry. 
probably it could be blocking. I'm sorry about that. So um, there is a, um, a clearly a positive correlation between the uh, inclusion and efficiency, whether you consider the overall index or the sub-index outreach and usage separately, you tend to find there is a positive uh, correlation. And uh, okay. And uh, um, what we did uh, next, because you know, all the, our dependent variable inclusion, efficiency, you know, these are bounded variables, right? These are bounded between zero and one. So sometimes see different estimators could be useful like fractional uh, uh, estimators, uh, like the one uh, I mentioned here, you know, Puck and Oldridge. That's why we use that here in addition to the, uh, the uh, other one. Um, so even then, uh, we, um, although we took care of here in this regression, the observed um, heterogeneity and also the, uh, we used to, um, we did not use here uh, firm level, uh, sorry, bank level heterogeneity here, unobserved heterogeneity, we did not use in this regression. And for that, uh, when we use, because this is a, a fractional uh, variable, we have our dependent variable is a fractional variable, it's important to use. Um, this Papke Uldridge methodology, and where we show here, use a Tobit estimator because it's very hard to use unobserved, like bank level on um, uh, heterogeneity. Okay, bank level unobserved heterogeneity. It's hard to take into account. For that, uh, we use this Tobit estimator. Okay, and even when we do that, you can see with regard to outreach, it's insignificant. Okay, it's not on average, it's not significant. So clearly, you would think that uh, that inclusion itself could be endogenous. Okay, meaning some countries are more inclusive, some countries are less inclusive. Why is that? Are there, is there anything that is driving that result? So could there be some other factors that could be contributing to the endogeneity of inclusion? To answer that, we then try to find, we have looked at many different instruments to explain uh, at the possible endogeneity of financial inclusion. To do that, we have used this share of informal economy. If a, if a country, um, you know, a country has a higher segment of the um, uh, higher segment of the activities in the informal sector. And uh, those countries, clear, you would expect uh, um, those countries to be less financially inclusive, okay? Would, meaning they would be more financially exclusive. They, they would have more financial exclusion. So clearly that's why you have this negative correlation here, okay? So that means higher the size of the informal sector, lower is going to be the degree of financial inclusion. So there would be higher level of exclusion in those countries. So that's why it's negative and significant. And there is another dimension we consider uh, here, uh, the um, you know, entrepreneurial ability of women, okay? So if it, we use that uh, uh, regulation and data across countries, we show that uh, higher the entrepreneurial ability of women in those countries that uh, they would be more, those countries would be more um, inclusive. Clearly there is going to be demand for banking services, okay, bank accounts. Um, even if you are in, the, you already have a bank account in those households, right? You will still have demand for the additional other members of the household. So therefore you can see that here, that is across, this is of course overall across countries on average, we find that there is a positive correlation. So countries with, the, um, with this, uh, uh, you know, with women having hi um, higher entrepreneurial ability to work in those countries are more financially 
inclusive, okay? So it's positive and significant. After having done that, these two instruments are valid. Oh, we have all the tests here. And uh, we show that uh, even the predicted level of financial inclusion, which when it's being used in the second stage, we show that uh, all those, whether we say sub-indices outreach uses or the overall level of inclusion, all these in, um, uh, indicators are positively associated with, uh, with the bank level performance, okay? So that is very robust in that sense, but still we cannot in conclude anything with regard to, um, with regard to uh, causal inf inference, okay? We cannot establish a causal um, relationship, which I will do towards the end. I probably don't have much time, but uh, uh, I will um, take a few minutes, yeah, to um, conclude. So now, for how to explain? How to explain um, uh, this this association? We see there is a positive correlation. How do we uh, explain how it is happening? You know, financial inclusion is something. It is happening at a country level, right? How does it get translated, transmitted to better performance at bank level? Okay, so therefore we need to look at some of the characteristics of banks. What way a certain characteristics of banks are getting influenced by this policy which is happening at a country level, right? So if we want to establish a channel, always we have to look at the we consider the, the dimensions or characteristics of the unit of analysis that is bank here and see in that uh, how it is getting impacted. So what the, way, the point I made earlier with regard to that illustration I gave uh, the Indian case, uh, we got to be looking at uh, banks which rely on deposit funding as their main source of finance, okay? So uh, we separate then, we consider customer deposit funds at bank level. Okay, we look at some banks are uh, highly dependent, more dependent on, uh, um, on you know, deposit funding, and there are some banks they don't. So we look at that. So we look at the customer deposit funding share, okay, share of customer deposit funds, then look at the volatility of that over time. Okay, so we can calculate uh, that customer deposit uh, um, funding share and calculate volatility with every three, you know, moving uh, volatility or standard deviation calculation we can do. This is the sigma, you see, standard deviation of this customer deposit funding share. And as that, uh, so you would expect uh, this one, if it is highly volatile, it will not help banks, right? So that's why it's negative and significant. If it is, uh, if that funding share is highly volatile, meaning today you are getting in deposit money, let's say it's going out tomorrow or for whatever reason. So that's not going to be beneficial. When would it be? But if you are operating in a country with a greater level of financial inclusion, when we interact, you see the effect turns positive and significant. That means that uh, uh, banks, uh, those who are operating in more inclusive countries, in those countries, they are, uh, they are able to garner more retail deposits, which are relatively more stable. And that indeed gives rise to a positive improvement or an improvement in their performance. You could do that with the uh, stability score, or we could do that with the efficiency score and so on. Now, one could question that, the, the, the way we calculated. So we replace that with return volatility. You look at return on assets at bank level, then calculate uh, standard deviation with every three observations. We, um, then we look at uh, the impact of that. Look at this here. This is the sigma here. This is the standard deviation of return on assets at bank level clearly. <clears throat> banks with the higher volatility of their return on asset is what is profitability, right? <clears throat> Sorry, profitability, if there is highly volatile, it has a negative impact on their 
efficiency score, right? It's not good if you have a more volatile, um, you know, uh, profitability pattern. So, but if those banks are operating in countries with a greater level of financial inclusion, they are still able to withstand, they are still able to mitigate the negative consequences or negative effect of uh, um, this uh, uh, return volatility. You see, the effect turns positive and significant. So now we could argue that uh, these are the channels, which type of uh, banks benefit from financial inclusion, the ones who rely more on deposit funding. And that's the, that's the main benefit of financial inclusion. The benefit comes through deposit channel, not to begin with, okay? We could also argue because we looked at uh, the overall coefficient, right, on average, but clearly this, this effect could be different for different banks, right? So what we do is here, we'll try to look at this relationship between inclusion and efficiency at different points on their performance distribution. What is performance here? Bank efficiency score. So we look at some are more efficient banks, some are less efficient banks. You can look at that. Those who are more efficient, they really, they are not interested in inclusion. So that's why the effect here is insignificant. It doesn't matter for those very better performing banks. So you can think about private banks foreign banks, they're not interested in inclusion. So more, it's basically visible in the context of banks, which are primarily middle tier banks, okay? Those who are in the middle of this distribution, they tend to benefit more from inclusion. So not uh, very top tier banks, not very uh, low tier banks. They also don't benefit because, you know, nobody wants to go and put their money with a bank, which is a bad bank, right? Or is a less uh, not performing bank. So, you know, there are risks. So that is something sometimes people make mistakes. Uh, they go to banks uh, because they don't know what the bank is uh, doing. So there is that uh, asymmetric information. So this uh, Although we are getting this result, but uh, um, um, as I discussed earlier, this is an issue for more, more for developing and emerging market economies, not for advanced countries, right? Because in our sample that I used, we have so many advanced countries also in there. Not many, majority are developing. So we have used, uh, we have used to, uh, countries for which there is data in the financial access survey, right? We are not pre-selecting, okay? There is no pre-selection bias. It's basically countries for which this data is available. We have included those countries in our analysis. So uh, what we see here is developing emerging market economies. When you separate, clearly you can see the correlation is highly significant only in the context of those countries, not so much in the case of advanced economies, okay? It can be also negative because really when you have 90% of your adults, uh, they're already part of the banking system, what more you could do? There is, ad addition, there is no gain by bringing in people uh, who really don't have any income or could be risky also if you have any kind of uh, exposure to them. You know, they could be taking overdraft and it's kind of loss going after them. So it can have a negative impact on a bank to bring in those people, right? So therefore, we need to exclude these advanced economies from the analysis, then undertake this. Either we do this classification on the basis of uh, income per capita, GDP per capita, and then we separate it, or consider credit to GDP ratio, and then consider countries which are more financially developed, countries which are less financially developed. So the ones who are, more financially developed, you will take their private credit to GDP ratio above the sample mean, and then run that uh, regression, we find that uh, the countries which are more financially developed, they don't benefit from inclusion. You can see statistically significant and negative here, okay? So uh, really not much gain from inclusion in those countries, but if you are in countries which have a lower level of financial development, in those countries, there is room for inclusive financial development. You can bring in more people because they are there. 
but they don't have access. And that is beneficial. We also show that here, even at an, uh, even in separating countries. Now this regulation, there is this idea, but uh, we have uh, not much time, right? I was supposed to speak for uh, uh, one hour. So can I take maybe five minutes to conclude? Yeah? Yeah, sure, uh, sure, please. Yeah, yeah. so, um, okay. So this is one uh, about, I mentioned about regulation to begin with. There was a hypothesis that we'd consider two regulations countries with a higher level of restrictions on banking activities, right? What they can do, what they're not allowed to do, things like that. We use that data. So clearly, you know, when you already have a higher level of restrictions on your activities, inclusion is not beneficial banks in those countries. That, that could be actually increasing risk for them. So it's kind of negatively correlated and significant as well. On the other hand, when we consider um, capital requirement, right? Banks need to maintain, right? You know, 8.5, 8% or 12%, depending on these different types of regulation. Some countries comply, some countries don't comply, but there is this requirement. If you do that, it really beneficial for banks uh, uh, in, in bad times, right? In bad times, say, uh, if you have uh, if you have more capital during good times, you can use it eh, against any kind of loss that could occur during bad times, right? So when you are operating in an inclusive uh, inclusive system, even if you have higher level of capital stringency, still it is going to be beneficial because you have access to these deposit funds, right, which you could use and um, to, to invest or to um, uh, explore uh, uh, high return investments, right? Risky investments, in other words, it could increase the upper limit for uh, risky investment. You are restricted how much risky, risky investment one could go for, but if you have higher level of deposit funds, funding is not an issue in those countries, um, banks could actually still find it beneficial, even in the presence of capital, higher level of capital requirement. Okay, so that's why the effect is positive and significant. We show that in doing this marginal plots, you can see here, the effect uh, even increases. If you are in a more inclusive system, even with higher level of capital regulation, it is still beneficial, which is not the case if you are in a restrictive, very restrictive system. Okay, we show actually, we explain this using a theoretical uh, model and keeping the loan exposure constant. Uh, and then we show that how this deposit channel could benefit uh, banks. I have, I'm not, I don't have time to go through that, but uh, you could look at the paper which is there, or if there are questions, I can go into that. Now, uh, so far I've just spoke about, I just have two more slides, I'll be quick. Eh? Uh, so um, we, so far I have spoken, I used the index that is constructed using information at uh, uh, bank level from the supply side. In other words, what banks provide, bank branches, ATMs, and so on. These are the things they provide and therefore uh, accounts also they provide and we constructed the index. Now what I'm doing here, I am replacing uh, that index with information from the demand side. What is that? This is called Findex. It is provided by World Bank, this data. How do they collect this data? They actually do survey across countries, different countries, all countries. They do the survey, ask people, do you have a bank account, right? And um, do you have any account in a formal financial institution? So then they calculate uh, with reference to um, the total number of adults, they calculate the percentages. So we use that as an indicator of inclusion, which is called global FINDEX, right? When we use that, and then we look at the performance, bank performance in those countries, it's still positive and statistically significant, okay? Similarly, there is also another indicator called um, say Findex, but it uses information in, in, in terms of uh, 
do you have a, this is a question they ask, do you have a savings in a financial institution? Um, and uh, if it is yes, then basically they count those number of people relative to total number of adults in that country and compute the percentage. And we use that information here and you can see here, it is also positive and statistical significant. And this information is coming from the demand side. It is not what banks provide, right? It's actually what, uh, what uh, whether people have or they don't have, okay? So, um, uh, so that is being considered because those who don't have, basically they would like to have, but they are excluded, right? So even using that information from the demand side, we can still show that there is a positive correlation between inclusion and bank level performance, right? Finally, um, <clears throat> finally we look at <clears throat> uh, a policy intervention. I mentioned about this AFI in the beginning, Alliance for Financial Inclusion. And subsequently, as part of that, there was a declaration called Maya Declaration in Mexico in 2011. And uh, um, in that uh, summit in Mexico, countries actually came together to introduce policies uh, to have a pro-access agenda, okay? To allow people to get, in, get included in the banking system, formal banking system. So therefore, once you are part of this network, you are likely to, to do something about it. There are some commitments. If you look at the Maya Declaration, it's in the paper, the number of things you got to do. So that means that there is a pro-access uh, agenda by these countries. So therefore, we put them as a treatment group. These countries are doing something about inclusion. All other countries, they don't do anything about inclusion. If it happens, if it, uh, it happens, otherwise, eh? there is no inclusion, right? So, so what we do is we create a con treatment group considering these countries because they are actively pursuing pro-access policy agenda, right? The others don't, that's your control group. So in, in then we try to do this uh, and look at whether this kind of pro-access policy intervention, whether this policy is effective or it is beneficial for, uh, uh, for uh, banks to do well in those countries. Okay, clearly we can see, even in, you know, think about these countries, these are very poor countries, right? And when, uh, and some of them are also Muslim middle tier, but uh, in these majority are kind of low income uh, countries. And you can see the, the, when they are doing something about it in those countries, even though they're poor countries, still banks in those countries are benefiting because of that pro-access policy, okay? So this way we can actually um, uh, do, this is like, this is a causal identification to show really whether inclusion does contribute, does lead to better bank level performance or not. And one could also question, you know, really maybe our control group is not really balanced, right? It doesn't have the similar characteristics as the treatment group, like the countries we have here, right? So what we do then, we try to match the characteristics of, uh, of the control group with this treatment group on based on propensity score. And then when we create, create a matched sample and then we run this, uh, correlation, uh, this uh, regression again, and you can see that uh, even then the effect is still positive and significant. Therefore, we conclude that uh, financial inclusion lead to, okay, and does explain um, uh, bank level performance, okay? So countries with the better level of, uh, um, um, countries with higher level of inclusion tend to have banks with the, better performance, right? So therefore there is a positive association between inclusion and efficiency. And um, we, we could do this using this uh, broad sample of, uh, you know, uh, uh, 86 uh, uh, countries uh, over um, 11 years, 2004 to 2011, 2015. And uh, this relationship is stronger in countries with uh, um, limited restrictions on banking activities or uh, even in countries with higher level of capital regulation, okay? So with regard to exploring channels, we showed 
that inclusion helps banks to lower return volatility and uh, to also mitigate any negative effect due to customer deposit funding share. Okay, so therefore, um, it is through that deposit channel banks are better off. And this also um, is a robust, even if we consider less developed financial markets and separating them from more developed financial market or more developed economies relative to uh, emerging, emerging and developing countries. We find that this inclusive financial development is a, um, more apparent in countries with less developed financial markets because there is room to do so, room to bring in people, those who are excluded from the banking system, even uh, uh, by exploiting a cross-country and temporal variation, considering the timing of inclusive financial agenda in a DID setup, difference in differences setup, we show that uh, enabling inclusive financial env environment is indeed beneficial for banks. Okay, I stopped there. I'm sorry, I took a bit longer. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I stopped there, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Shanda. That was really insightful. Uh, I would like to open the floor for the question and answers now. Uh, if I can request Professor Chitrakal to go first. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor. So I have uh, just one question. So, uh, uh, so my question is that in one of the slides where you showed the results of your IV topic model, uh, there are the two of the yeah. variables that you have uh, included. One is share of informal economy and uh, women's entrepreneurial ability. So I was wondering, yeah. can there be an interaction effect uh, between these two? Because uh, at least in India, in rural areas, we have seen that in informally, you know, women mm. have been, I mean, have been, they have shown to have entrepreneurial uh, activities uh, in, in, in an informal way. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so basically we are saying that uh, there is a, that um, kind of some correlation between those two instruments, right? Um, so, yes. because really, and uh, you know, this uh, entrepreneur ability, I think uh, that is capturing regulation in uh, so countries, those who have some regulation, um, and uh, there are countries that probably don't allow, right, women to work. So maybe, so that, that it's a like, a, it's a coding variable, which uh, we took from the World Bank data set. Huh? Uh, I think it's women, business, and law, that sort of data set. It's a legal variable. and uh, But I take your point that there could be some degree of correlation between the two, and uh, one could introduce, but in uh, the kind of interaction term in that same regression, right? That's what, that's what you are saying. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. So we haven't, we didn't try that, but yeah, this is a good point. Uh, which um, could be um, used because these are two instruments. That's why we didn't try to look at that. It is possible that uh, uh, why, why the inter interaction is important. Uh, it is possible that uh, in a more inclusive uh, countries with a greater share of informal economy in those countries, there could be, you know, maybe women are not allowed uh, to work, or they could be working in the informal sector. That is also possible. So, hence, uh, there could be some overlap between these two variables. So, but oh, yeah, I take the point. Yeah, it, it could be checked if it is still significant or not. Mm. Thank you. When I when I, uh, I, I this this question came into my mind because. I was uh, uh, thinking about the Grameen Bank uh, experience in Bangladesh, and mm. you know the, how the women form small um, uh, cooperative societies and self-help uh, help mm. groups. So that's yeah, 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 yeah. Now I take your point. That is a good point. See, we you know just to kind of uh, 
mention, we tried with many different instruments, uh, you know, in the paper has gone through like four or five rounds of revision, uh, but uh, different uh, round, we were using like different instruments. We used to initially mobile uh, subscription, and then that we had to drop uh, because it could be correlated, you know, access to internet we had. So you see there are a lot of variables we have tried and uh, we are kind of discarding and then using new one just to place eh, the referees. So, so this, these are the final two we kind, we kind of settled with. Eh? But uh, I take your point, it's always hard to find external instruments for any you know, um, explanatory variable that could be endogenous. It's very hard, that's why this concept of you know this causal identification is becoming so important to to make a point on any correlation between the two variables. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But again, I say yeah. With the, we don't have this. This could be done. We don't have self-help group information, so that could have been also used. Uh, but um, yeah, that that is something which one could do. Um, looking at a, focusing on a one particular country rather than a cross country exercise. Because this is a very Indian concept, right? Self help group. And it's not probably, I don't think it's in that, it's, it's happening in different ways. In Africa, they don't do similar way, but uh, different ways. So, therefore, the comparability across countries would be a problem. Uh, but, you know, to do an individual, uh, one country, one could actually do this exercise. In, uh, with that information. Um, so there is a one question here uh, in the chat box, uh, I'm looking at it. Uh, zero balance accounts, does the usage dimension account for this? Uh, usage dimension basically counts how many accounts are there. So it could be taking, if, you know, any account, even with a zero balance, it will still be part of it. It's just a number of accounts, right? That's what it does, it, the number. And uh, there could be, I agree, there could be the possibility of multiple accounts by the same individual. That is possible. Clearly, it's there. You know, we all have multiple accounts, right? And, um, but uh, uh, I, it doesn't happen for people probably at the lower end uh, of the income distribution. Uh, but it does happen at the kind of middle to top tier, uh, top end of the income distribution. Those people tend to have multiple accounts. Uh, but uh, we have tried to deal with that because this is a point actually, even the referee raised this point, uh, multiple accounts. So you will see in the paper, it's there is a bit of discussion by adjusting the data. We have done some kind of adjustment, but yeah, this is a problem. We cannot get away from that problem. Multiple accounts would be there, um, but uh, yeah, uh, uh, one could do some kind of adjustment, but that won't be a perfect way to deal with that. Um, yeah, financial literacy, there is this problem, a question about financial literacy. Uh, that is possible. Those who are not financially aware, uh, they may not be able to use the, um, you know, uh, banking, or they could might not be inclusive. So therefore, uh, that could explain the endogeneity of financial inclusion. That is possible, but that uh, uh, is all about having information on financial literacy across countries. If you can. Uh, um, get hold of that, but it's it's definitely a good instrument. Okay, financial level of financial literacy across countries. Uh, if people are more more aware, yes, obviously they would be. Um, they will be part of the banking system. But you know, I, I think with this uh, financial inclusion program in India, I think it was a because it was a government drive. It made people aware, and they came forward and opened accounts because they were allowed. And that's how the government could connect to those people. They were, the government had no connection, no linkage. And so it's also beneficial for, uh, uh, sorry, for the government and beneficial also for uh, people, those who are opening an account. It is true that they would always prefer to 
uh, select or go to a bank which is located closer regardless of the performance of nobody actually looks at how good a bank is as long as they get so that's where I, I think financial literacy is very important because if you don't know you get to a wrong bank they clearly could lose your money and uh, I don't think that uh, uh, the insurance policy across uh, I, I mean deposit insurance I think that's an important thing how much or what uh, proportion of your money is insured just in case the bank fails so that information is also important for people to decide whether to put their money or not, you know. So, um, uh, yeah. Uh, there is another question here, it's about female employment falling in India. Um, yeah, so employment is declining, of course, so. Um, so that is a, uh, if there is employment falling, um, so clearly there is going to be less income coming to the banks, right? Um, so, but still banks, uh, uh, as long as you have accounts, suppose you have no employment, you still get, I am not sure, you have benefits coming from the government, right? So it depends on the, what are the benefit schemes you have in different countries. And uh, particularly, I think India, I'm not aware uh, the the extent of uh, benefit transfer, which is there for different schemes. There is money transfer, but with regard to employment, uh, one has to check what kind of employment benefits. If you become unemployed for whatever reason, is there some kind of benefit transfer, uh, you know, that is coming from the government. So if that is there, banks will benefit to that extent. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. So I was wondering because the microfinance, uh, all the microfinance success was driven by uh, mostly by females. Uh, so in that regard, I was asking this question. So will, will it still be beneficial? Yeah. So, but thanks. Thanks for taking up my question. Yeah. yeah okay. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, a few more questions. Uh, I believe that's all we have. Uh, so thank you so very much, Professor. It was indeed a very, very insightful lecture. And thank you so much for taking time out from your schedule and talking to all of us and presenting your work here. And I would also like to thank all the center members for taking this initiative of starting the inspiration lecture series. It's actually such a great inspiration for the young researchers and also for the other researchers to hear from the best in the uh, academia. So thank you so very much, all the attendees. Thank you so much, all the faculty members for attending this. And thanks again, Professor, for taking time out for this. Yeah, thank you very much once again. Very good. It is good to be here. Yeah, thank you. Yes, uh, I would also like to invite all of you to the next lecture that is scheduled for 25th of March, which will be delivered by Professor Kenneth R. French from Tuck School of Business. So I would like to invite all of you to the lecture on 25th March by Professor Kenneth as well. So thank you so very much for today, all of you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.